Americans have forged a special bond and a unique partnership. When you get that relationship with a horse, sky is the limit of what you can do. From the frigid Arctic to the hottest desert, discover what makes horses and humans so perfect for each other. Without them, we wouldn't be here. Wednesday evening at 7. Here's what's new this month with Passport. I know what you are. You don't know anything about me. In Zambia's Luangwa Valley, a future king was born. Franklin is endlessly interesting. He really was an American genius. These and all your favorite shows are available with Passport on the PBS app. Download it today. The British King, George III, is hallucinating. What was really the King's condition? I need a window into George's mind. The royal family granted unprecedented access to his personal papers. The documentation is so extraordinary. This is like a frontline report in the King's bedside. Can the new evidence settle what was wrong with George once and for all? Tonight at 7. Time. It's an interesting thing. We always wonder what time it is. And other times, we wonder, where does it go? That's because time flies and waits for no one. So is it time to donate that car that keeps costing you money? If you've been waiting to give to public television, consider donating a car, truck, or RV. And we'll arrange for a free pickup. You may even qualify for a tax deduction. There's no time like now. Donate today. Programming on Montana PBS is made possible in part by viewers like you. And by the Montana Nursery and Landscape Association, a trade association of horticulture professionals who can assist with yard, gardening, and outdoor space questions. Members in your area can be found at plantingmontana.com. And by the Montana Farmers Union, a grassroots organization working for family farmers, ranchers, and rural communities. Online at montanafarmersunion.com. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. You're tuned to Montana Ag Live, originating tonight from the studios of KUSM on the very dynamic campus of Montana State University and coming to you over the Montana Public Television System. I'm Jack Rieselman, retired professor of plant pathology, honored to be your host this evening. And as usual, we again have an all-women panel. I will tell you, as those of you who have been walking, are watching so far this year, we are featuring women in agriculture. And a, a little bit of history. When I started graduate school many, many years ago, there was not a single woman in plant pathology at the University of Nebraska graduate program. Now, at most universities, over half of the students in master's or doctorate programs are women. And we're seeing that because they're really actively involved with agriculture, and we'll get into that tonight. But first, let me introduce the panel. Mary Burroughs. Mary spends a little time in the dean's office, but most of the time she's actually a plant pathologist with the Extension Service. If you have disease questions, anything to do with plants that don't look right to you, this is a good chance to call it in and find out what's going on. Special guest tonight, Erica Rodbill. Erica is a graduate student in entomology She's going to be one of the next leaders in the next generation of people in agriculture. So I thought it'd be nice to have a graduate student on, tell her what her goals are, 
things like that. You learn a lot about educational activities and promotions here in the state of Montana. Jane, Jane Mangold, she likes to be called an invasive plant specialist. I prefer to call her a weed scientist. And we argued about that before the program, and I lost. And Abby Saeed, Abby is our extension horticulturalist. If you have questions tonight about horticulture, it's a great chance to ask them. And answering the phone tonight, and the phone number will be on the screen shortly. Without your questions, this program gets very boring. So get those questions coming in. The two phone operators tonight are Nikki and Joe Vredenberg. They're here in the studio with us, and I thank them for coming in. Erica, back to you. Tell us what you do, what your program is here as a grad student at MSU. I started my PhD about three years ago in the plant science and plant pathology department. And I study insecticide resistance, mainly pyrethroid resistance in alfalfa weevil populations in the Western region. So I just got back from Oregon and Washington yesterday. I'm still in recovery mode. <laughs> <laughs> But it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. How big a problem is the alfalfa weevil in the West? Well, if you're an alfalfa producer, it's pretty huge. Um, there are populations that are still susceptible to pyrethroids, which is really important to retain within the landscape. However, we have also identified populations that are extraordinarily resistant to every type 2 pyrethroid that we have come across in the West. So pyrethroids are a type of insecticide. They are. They're actually relatively safe, as I've been told. Yes. Um, how is, is there any other insecticides that you can use for the weevil, or is it just primarily the pyrethroids? Pyrethroids have been historically used for the past 40 years or so. But there is an alternative mode of action group, mode of action group 22A, which encompasses endoxicarb, which is the active ingredient of okay. steward. And that is the only alternative much. insecticide available for forage alfalfa producers. So that, that makes it a critical problem. Okay. We'll come back to you because I want to learn a little bit more about the alfalfa weevil. Um, I find it fascinating. But we'll go to Mary here. And this question came in a couple of weeks ago. I grabbed it off of this technology machine called Slack in a computer. And this person is on their fourth crab apple in 25 years. It's fire blight. Any suggestions on how they can avoid it? Well, I think, you know, Abby, you've got a good Mont guide on resistant varieties that you can select and then sanitation. They might have a bunch of apples in the neighborhood around them that have fire blight. So um, there are some antibiotics you can spray at the right time. Uh, those usually aren't recommended for homeowners. I think the timing is, is pretty critical. Um, but Abby, do you want to comment any more? Yeah, and if, if, you, if you do have it, you want to prune, pr just prune it out 8 to 12 inches from below where you're seeing that kind of blackened or, or the... And, the and clean your pruner between and each cut. Yeah, you want to clean those with alcohol between each cut. Mm -hmm. You know, I've lost my share of trees to fire blight in the time I've lived here in Montana. The one thing that I find that really exacerbates the problem is if you have a sprinkler irrigation system mm -hmm. that keeps them wet at night and they don't dry out. Yeah, and, and over fertilizing the trees as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, Jane, uh, this person uh, from Facebook says there are rush grasses invading an otherwise okay pasture. I assume that rush grasses are not good for pasture or hay. Any suggestions management-wise? Hmm. Rushes, uh, typically they're in wetter areas. They like a little more moisture than most of our uh, grasses. So I wonder if it'd be interesting to know if there's anything going on there with the irrigation or maybe change in groundwater or something that could be leading those rushes to, or leading to those rushes increasing. I don't. I don't think they're typically as desirable to graze either. So um, if there was some overgrazing, the rushes could be increasing because of that. But I, yeah, I don't, I don't know for sure. Are, are they associated with salinity or mm. why do you think the water is involved? Well, they tend to just like a little more water than okay. like a grass, you know, The a amount grass. of water, okay. Yeah, yeah. Are they different than sedges? Yes. 
Okay. Yeah, don't ask me too many questions about these grass-like species because um, I don't work with them very much. But yes, rushes are different than sedges. Um, rushes are round, sedges have edges. Okay. And grasses have nodes. I'm not going to go there. I've done it with my body over the years. Um, Erica, this person says, um, what made you interested in agriculture and why did you choose MSU as a place to go? Okay, um, so I'm originally from upstate New York. I was not raised in agriculture at all. Um, so I got into agriculture because when I was studying abroad, I was struck by a pressing question. And that is that when you go to conserve land, I was in a, a nature preserve in Tanzania, and there was a lot of anxiety surrounding food production in communities surrounding this nature preserve. And in order for conservation to work, we have to retain those lands out of agricultural production. But who are we to say where agriculture can or cannot be produced? And that set me off on my journey, which was to look into sustainable agriculture production. How can we maximize the amount of food that we can produce on a smaller amount of land? so that we can, in turn, preserve these natural spaces. And so I went to Iowa State, got my master's degree there in Go entomology. Cyclones. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did a co-major in entomology and sustainable agriculture. And soon after my graduation, I was offered a position here at MSU in, in Kevin Warner's lab. And I was really interested in it because it was a Western region problem, insecticide resistance. And I was really interested in seeing how we can retain these tools for producers to use them to the future. And so that's how I wound up here. It was a cool project. Well, I enjoy it immensely. It sounds like it's a lot of fun. It is. And it's, it's a regional project. It's just not Montana. And I like that. <laughs> uh, Abby from Helena. Everybody has rhubarb this time of year, or they should if they like rhubarb custard pie like I do. Uh, the stalks are getting firm, sort of rubbery. Is there anything they could do to help prevent rhubarb from, I'd say, maturing too early? Um, I'm surprised that's a problem right now, um, but yeah, I don't know how to prevent that. Is that a water? It, it could be a water. Or is it an old patch? Yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to know if, if it was an old patch. Sometimes those get woody um, or, um, but yeah, um, maybe just more consistent watering um, keeps it, you know, nice and. Yeah, I cut some rhubarb yesterday and it was, I'd say if anything, a little tough. Uh, yeah. So. Would, could that be cut from the cold weather? That's a good point. It very possibly Possible. could be, yeah. It is growing slower this year. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question for Abby. Mm -hmm. So my rhubarb, the you know the stems are only about maybe six to seven inches long, but it's already getting it's getting ready to bolt. Yeah. Is is there anything you can do about that, or are certain varieties more likely to bolt? Too I don't early? know if certain varieties are more likely to bolt early, but I would harvest it early if, if it's looking like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, mine is a little bit short right now too, and it's it's looking like that as well. Okay. So I think I'm going to be making some some rhubarb sauce sometime this coming week. Probably. Good. All right, I'll do the same. You want to make some rhubarb wine. <laughs> I've never made rhubarb wine. Uh, I'm more of a, a pie cook. person. I mean, uh, <laughs> you had to try it. All right, uh, Mary. This is an interesting question. I'm I'm going to throw it to you as it came in. It's from Florence, and the caller has frog's eye in his grass. Is there any way to manage it, and can it be eliminated? Yeah, I know so a frog's I, eye leaf spot? I think they're probably talking about something we only talk about once a year. Snow? Fairy rain. Oh, why I, fairy I would, so I've heard some people call it. Yeah, okay. Frog I've never heard it called that. Um, that's an old term. And frog eye leaf spot's on soybeans, so I was a little confused. <laughs> um, Fairy rings are just uh, caused by decaying plant material underneath the soil. So anything you can do to 
you make the amount of nitrogen in the soil more uniform. So you know, we directed fung uh, fertilizer applications. There are some fungicides that can be applied, I think, in the fall by a pesticide applicator if they really right. disturb them or just kind of enjoy them. I think they're pretty. I think they're yeah. pretty, yeah. yeah. I don't worry about them very much. No. Yeah. You know, Jane, we have several questions. Last week, one this week. The one this week, person wants to know whether or not you can control bulbous bluegrass by mowing. You have some here. Let's talk about it. Yeah, I did bring some bulbous bluegrass with me today because uh, I know Noel, our diagnostician at the Scudder Lab, has been getting a lot of this in. It's very noticeable right now. It's starting to get its uh, flowering heads. The, the, the grass is a, a shallow bunch grass, but as it grows up, it gets these really kind of hairy, messy, unkempt looking uh, heads. And this has a little bit of time to mature yet before it actually produces these little, they're called bulbils, and they're actually baby plants that just fall off the uh, plant and can start growing uh, right away. There's no dormancy, so it doesn't produce seeds. It actually produces these bulbils. Um, at this, this point right now, uh, it's probably, it's getting a little late to do too much of anything, actually. Uh, if you're going to treat this with a herbicide, you want to do it before it starts getting all fuzzy and hairy, messy looking up at the top of the plant when you just have the basil leaves. Um, the one thing I would say to not do with this plant at this stage is mow it because you will just scatter those these bulbils that are forming up at the top of the plant. And uh, they're not seeds, they're actually baby plants. And if you mow it, you're gonna toss them all over the place and they're ready to grow. Um, yeah, it's, this is a plant that seems to be, have been increasing across the West, especially Wyoming and Montana for the last probably eight years now. Where is it native to? Just that, I'm curious. Uh, it's native to Europe, I think Europe and Asia, where a lot of our weedy species come from. It's kind of an interesting story with this plant because it, it came to North America accidentally, and uh, it was actually explored as a turf grass um, at various times over the decades. Um, it's been, they've tried to breed it and to make different varieties of it uh, for a turf, but it, it's also never really worked for that either. Hmm. It's not a noxious weed, though. It's not a noxious weed. Okay. And it is a perennial. It's, it's not an annual like our cheatgrass or bentonado or Japanese brome. It actually does have a perennial root system, so it comes back year after year after, from that root system, but you can see it's pretty shallow and it's very early to green up in the spring. Don't tell me to pull it, that's hard work. Mm -hmm. I pulled this, but it was kind of growing in a sandy, <laughs> okay. sandy area. Um, interesting question for Erica. Um, why entomology? Um, I'll go back, you know, I always figured budding entomologists when I was a kid were those that were shooting ants with rubber bands. But <laughs> <laughs> what triggered you to get into entomology? <laughs> Um, well, I guess opportunity. Uh, I was offered a research fellowship uh, where I did my undergrad at St. Lawrence University up in Canton, New York. And it was to look at pollinating fly diversity, so surfids. And I really enjoyed the work. I was out when the sun was out and I was home in the lab when it was raining. Um, and it was a wonderful mixture of field and lab work and I got to work in really diverse agricultural production zones, and I got to see really cool diversity when it came to insects in these systems. And I guess one of the issues with going to a small school is that you don't necessarily get exposed to many of these special fields. So entomology was not a course that was offered. And if it wasn't for this research opportunity that I had, I would never have known that I was interested in insects at all. So. You know, there's always one or two people in a career that develops that it really influences the direction that you go on. My particular case was a mycology professor at Colorado State many, many years ago. I assume there's one or two individuals that really triggered your interest. Am I right? Oh, yes. Yep. There's one in particular. 
You want to mention that? Yep, Dr. Ashwini Pai. She's a botanist, actually, at St. Lawrence, and she really took a chance on me, and it worked out in my favor. Okay. Yeah, I figure, and I think that's a message to all students that somewhere along the line, you're going to meet one individual in your college career that's really going to have an influence on which way you want to go. And right or wrong, you know, that happens. Anyway, back to Abby. Um, this person wants to know, do they need to do anything to transplants before they plant them? And I'm not sure what kind of transplants they're referring to. Yeah, um, so I'm thinking in general, if you are, um, you know, raising seedlings indoors before you plant them outside, you don't want to just, you know, when the when the temperatures are right. So usually if, if they're those warm season ones waiting until early June for here in Bozeman, you don't want to just put them out right away. You want to um, kind of uh, harden them off and, and get them uh, accustomed to those uh, outdoor temperatures so um, I usually set them outside for a few days um, uh, during the daytime and then bring them back in and do that for about a week before I put them into the ground to get them well suited. What if they're really pot bound on some of these things? Do you want to loosen the roots on yeah, them? Yeah, you do want to loosen the roots and, and kind of keep an eye um, on, on those pot bound ones. Usually um, once in a while I've had to do that with some where I've had to transplant them into a slightly larger um, flat and um, before putting them out. I have a feeling with this spring, this extended spring, we have a lot of etiolated tomatoes in people's greenhouses. Oh yeah. yeah. You want to talk about how to kind of bury those yeah. and maybe some plants not to bury? Yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah. So tomatoes are great. They have adventitious roots. So you can kind of, if you have like really long leggy plants um, that look a little bit spindly, you can bury them horizontally and leaving a little bit up out there and the roots are gonna form from where you've buried that tissue. And that's gonna be a good way to help that plant get established and not be that spindly looking plant. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, and a lot of transplants probably will be going in the ground this week because yeah. finally it looks like we're having some favorable weather for getting in the ground. It is going to be Memorial Day though. It always snows on Memorial Day. Uh, yeah, <laughs> usually Memorial Day snows. Yeah, you're right, Mary. You've been here long enough to know that. Um, from Whitefish, and actually we have several questions about getting rid of gophers. What type of poison do you recommend getting rid of voles? We don't have the expertise here tonight to handle that, but I will try to get Stephen Van Tassel with the Montana Department of Ag to be on the panel before this show is gone for the summer. And Stephen, you can contact him. He's in Lewistown. Look him up on Montana Department of Ag website, and he'll give you all kinds of ways to get rid of these little annoying animals. Uh, Jane. Um, from the Great Falls area, a person read about spraying a bacteria on cheatgrass in burned areas in Idaho. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I, I'm guessing they're probably talking about the bacteria Pseudomonas fluorescens. That is a cold loving soil bacteria that has been tested as a control, a bio control for cheatgrass. Um, and it was developed in Washington, Eastern Washington, and uh, we've done field testing in Montana. We had seven or eight sites scattered across the state, and we followed those plots for four years and did not see any effect of the bacteria. There's also been research done in Oregon and Washington on rangeland by, by other researchers, and they had similar results to ours in that we really didn't see an effect of that bacteria. So the work that's been done in Washington, um, it, it just, from what we've seen in other parts of the West, it doesn't seem to hold true okay. and be effective. We also have a question, I don't remember exactly from where, but they would like you to talk a little bit about the new uh, cheatgrass herbicide. Yeah, there's a new product. Uh, it was actually labeled for control of annual grasses, including cheatgrass and bentonata and Japanese brome and medusa head, which are all in Montana. It was uh, approved for use in rangeland and natural areas in 2020. The trade name is called Rejuvra. The active ingredient is in Dazaflam. And it's actually a pre-emergent herbicide, so you would want to put that on 
in kind of late summer, early fall, before we start getting fall moisture that will stimulate the, the seeds of those annual grasses to emerge. And we're doing quite a bit of testing with it in Mon uh, at, at Montana State University with a variety of projects. It looks very promising. And one of the very appealing things about this product is that it does not affect perennial, already established perennial species because those roots are growing below where the herbicide hangs out in the soil. So. That brings up my question. Is it soluble and does it eventually go down? It is not very soluble and that's another attractive aspect of this herbicide. It, it binds very tightly to the soil in the top inch to inch and a half. Yep, and it, it lasts a long time. It has a lot of persistence. So uh, some of the work that's been done in Colorado, Wyoming, they're seeing three years of control of cheatgrass. The work we've done with Ventanata just north of Bozeman here, we've seen uh, four to five years of control from a single application. Wonderful. Yeah. That's good. Uh, <laughs> back to raspberries. Mary assured the audience that after two years of not having raspberries, we would have them this year. She lied to us. <laughs> so Mary, can you tell us what's wrong with the raspberries? I'm also a victim. <laughs> I was looking at them today and they're just barely leafed out and it's really inconsistent all over. And uh, we were talking about this before the show and Abby and I both haven't had raspberries for two years and I'm afraid this might be the third. So I think one more freeze event, uh, I don't know, it's pretty sad. Yeah, I wonder if some newer varieties are a little more. I planted mine about eight years ago, you know, so they're not ancient, and it was Toby's recommended variety. Yeah. Do you think it's it's just like abiotic environmental yeah. with oh, the yeah. temperatures yeah. and they, the moisture patterns? They looked fine this morning or this yeah. spring because I, you know, went in and pruned a bit and I checked because um, I was really nervous, but uh, they're just really behind normal. Yeah. That's too bad. It's tough to grow raspberries here. Uh, vinegar on garden weeds from Missoula. Jane, does that work? Yeah, well, it can. So vinegar is, we call it a contact herbicide in that it, it doesn't move around in the plant. It's just going to burn down the areas of the plant that it makes contact with. So it works on small seedlings. It can be effective. It is non-selective, so it will hurt anything that it gets and comes in contact with. It's also important to note that herbicidal vinegar is like, what, 30% acetic acid? Mm -hmm. Does that sound right, yeah, Abby? That does. And the vinegar on the shelf in your kitchen is like 5% yeah. acetic acid. So if you want to try to use vinegar, you need to use the herbicidal uh, concentration or strength of vinegar. And you need to use it very carefully, just like you would use a strong acid. It's 35% acetic acid. So you want to make sure you wear your protective gloves and, and eye protection and clean your sprayers. Yes. Afterwards yeah. or and, and if you want to kill a patch of grass for about three years, have your kids make volcanoes with baking soda and vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right no, on the works. grass. It works like a charm. <laughs> okay. Uh, Erica, this person from Townsend would like to hear a little bit more about the research that you're doing on the weevil. Uh, it's always been a problem in the Townsend area. Uh, so tell us exactly what you're finding so far. I know it's preliminary. Right. So um, Kevin, my PI, he's my major advisor, he and I published a paper last spring basically saying that there, there is resistance to pyrethroids in Montana. We identified three populations in Bighorn County specifically. Now, what we have found in the West is that there are resistant populations as well. And they follow this really interesting pattern. And that is that every type two pyrethroid we have tested, so that would be uh, Warrior, Mustang Max, Baythroid. If there's resistance to one, there's resistance to all type two pyrethroids. What things, the pattern really gets interesting when we start looking at type one pyrethroids. Now these are the original 
pyrethroids that were developed. And what we found is that the resistance does not extend to them. So if you have resistance to warrior, you won't have resistance to bifenthrin. So it's a really interesting pattern. It's still preliminary. We'll know a lot more by the end of the summer. But we've seen this pattern in Arizona, California, Oregon, Washington, and Montana from last year and the first half of this year. So certainly by the end of the summer, we'll get our final data set and be able to publish something pertaining to it. OK. Educate me a little bit on the alfalfa weevil. OK. Is it more of a problem on second cutting alfalfa than first cutting or third cutting than second cutting? Uh, in Montana, it would be the first cutting, yes. And it just slows down the emergence? Or what, what does a weevil actually do to the alfalfa plant? So in the early spring, when it becomes around average daily temperature, gets to be above 40 degrees, you'll start to see adult weevils get, get entering the field. So you'll see them walking around, eating alfalfa stems. Once the daily temperature reaches about a high of 70 degrees pretty consistently, that's when they really explode on you. That's when we start seeing the larvae really go to town on alfalfa. And that is really dangerous if you're an alfalfa producer. And the reason why it is incredibly dangerous for alfalfa production is that alfalfa weevil larvae are the econom economically damaging life stage. So the adults don't have to worry about them. They're not going to damage your yield at all but what is going to damage your yield is their offspring. And the reason for it is that the larvae only feed on the leaves, and this is where the majority of the protein is found in alfalfa. And if you lose your foliage, you lose protein content, which is extraordinarily damaging to the quality of the forage that you're selling to the market or feeding to your cattle. Okay, thank I, you. I have, another, I have a question for Erica, well, if I might. just go ahead and ask it. So Erica, for producers that have resistant weevils, what are their options for managing the weevil? Our current recommendation is to uh, diversify your management strategy. Now, depends on where you are. I've, I've talked to many a producer that do not agree with my recommendations, and they're totally in the right to disagree with me on them because I don't know everything. But what we do advise is that they employ a cultural control tactic like harvesting early. Some people, some producers are a little wary of this. And the reason why is because the alfalfa weevil larvae can feed under the windrows, meaning that after the hay is baled and removed, you see totally decimated alfalfa stands thereafter. And I've seen it too. But that's the major cultural control tactic that's currently being advised. Another option would be to rotate to endoxicarb. And this is concerning, right? This is the only alternative mode of action group available for producers at this point in time. And if we rely too much on endoxicarb, or steward is the, um, is the generic name, or not the generic name, sorry, is the market name for it. Um, if, we, if we rely too much on that, then we risk losing that, that tactic of control as well. So our current recommendations are to rotate as much as possible. Yeah, that and, makes sense. And adhere to integrated pest management strategies as much as you can. And that's not only for alfalfa weevil, it's for weeds and it's for diseases. So, you know, we get a lot of questions about pest problems in ornamental trees and shrubs. Abby, tell mm -hmm. us about this. Yeah, so this is a really great guide um, that was put together by um, folks in the Scudder Diagnostic Lab. And this is geared towards people that are out doing scouting and looking at plant problems, um, looking at pest disease um, issues. And it has some identification information as well. So this is just an excellent publication that uh, was released just a few months ago. And so if you are doing some scouting or if you are interested in learning more about some of the common pest disease issues that we have here in Montana, you can go to the uh, MSU bookstore and you can get this uh, publication. It's free. You'll just need to pay shipping to get it shipped to you or you can come by on campus and pick it up. Um, but this is a really great resource and it has 
um, a lot of just great information about a lot of the common pests and diseases that we have here. And unlike most Mont guides, it probably won't be in the county office? Yeah, this one's probably, yeah, not going to be in your county office. Um, so, uh, yeah, you'd want to get it from the bookstore. That's a very good point. So while we have all these show and tells, pistachio bars with cream cheese. And our favorite baker, <laughs> we ask her all the time to come in because she always brings treats. And guess who that might be based on the smile? <laughs> I thought you liked me on the show because I knew something about weeds, but I guess it's well, just because... She wants to be an invasive plant specialist. She don't want to be a weed scientist, but Jane, right. we appreciate it, and you do a great job. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Mary from Haver. This person has um, some winter wheat with irregular holes, or regular holes, near the base. Any idea what might be causing that? Well, it's probably an insect. Um, as the leaf grows, sometimes you get an insect chewing right as it's developing, and, and you'll just get just like, sometimes just six perfect little holes, a little different sizes based on the leaf expansion. Um, and that can be just about anything that um, pierced it with a stylet or nibbled on it. Okay. Um, Jane, since we kind of embarrassed you here a little bit, you want to <laughs> show us this other sticky weed that you have? Yeah, here? another show and tell. So I brought another uh, weed with me today. This is uh, catchweed. Um, it's the genus is Asperugo, and it is growing in the alley behind my house right now, so it's easy to grab. It's an annual uh, broadleaf plant. It's got really shallow roots. You can tear this thing out of the ground with no problem. And it's called catchweed because it's lined with hairs that if you run your finger across this plant, it kind of catches your skin. It feels kind of sticky. Um, so that's one way to know what you have is, is it sticky and catching your skin. Uh, the other thing is, well, a couple other things, at this point, uh, it's, it is flowering. It has these really tiny purple flowers um, at the tips of the stems. And then as those flowers mature into seeds, it gets kind of a star-shaped seed along the stem, or a pod. Um, so I just wanted to bring this one because I see it a lot, uh, especially in the urban areas. I do get calls about it. Uh, people have it in their wind, wind rows and whatnot. Um, or tree, you know, they're tree lines. Uh, so it is around, the, the best way to control it is just pull it out of the ground. It's super easy to pull out because of those shallow roots, not a lot of root hairs there. Um, and otherwise you could treat it with like a 2,4-D dicamba, but you would probably want to, uh, I think it would probably still be susceptible, but you're also already getting some seed production. So. I thought I knew what catchweed was, but that's different than what my dog drags in from the pasture all the time. And they call that catchweed too. So yeah, what's that? Yeah, that? that is, uh, I think that's probably catchweed bed straw, which is a gallium species, G-A-L-L-I-U-M. And that has more of a, the leaves are more in a whirl a, along the stem, and it is even stickier than this catchweed. Boy. But this is asperugo and the other one is gallium. Okay, uh, I have the other one and it's definitely stickier mm -hmm. than that. Yeah. that. But it, again, it's easy to pull. It's also an annual and it'll pull right out of the ground. It's increased a lot in the last few years. Any I think reason so. why? I, I don't know, this seems to have increased as well. Hmm. Okay, well, maybe someday we'll figure that out. Uh, Mary, this is an interesting question from Outlook. Do diseases increase insect activity or does insect activity increase disease pressure? Well, there are insects that can transmit diseases, right. such as my favorite, the viruses, um, and some other pathogens. Uh, the also, pat the, um, especially like the larval stages, if they feed on roots, then they'll get root rot. Um, in corn, the corn borer increases stock rot. Yeah. So basically that wounding action. Yeah, and that's very, very common. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt about that. Uh, <laughs> this, I've not heard of this before, but it's from Livingston. And this person says they've heard that no mow may, and I don't know what no mow may is, but it's a good way to improve lawns. 
ex have you heard of that before? Yeah, so Nomo May is uh, like a, it's a pollinator initiative. And so the idea is to not mow your lawn for the month of May so that the dandelions will grow. Uh, but that can be a little bit challenging for your grass. If, if you don't mow your grass for a whole month, um, the biggest issue with that is when you go to mow afterwards, you're probably taking too much of that, um, you know, the green growth off at once, which will shock the plant, can stress it out, it can thin out your lawns a little bit. So dandelions and other lawn weeds can be a great source of food. A lot of different pollinators will visit lawn weeds like that. Um, but I would say a good balance would be, um, let's say your grass is six inches tall, you don't want to take off more than two inches per mowing. So mm -hmm. you don't want to mow it all at once and get that down to the two and a half to three inches right after. In Montana, it should be no mow June. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Although my grass is already looking, it's it's like six inches tall right now, starting. Are you mowing your lawn in May? I I usually do one mowing, but I I, lo I love the dandelions, so I keep them in the lawn all mm -hmm. the time. You like dandelions? I do. Well, you live in a great area for dandelions. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> There's no shortage in the Gallatin mm -hmm. Valley. Um, from Stanford, is there a chemical that can be used to spray white top that will not hurt other bushes nearby? I'm guessing that's for me. Yeah, you're uh, right. <laughs> that wouldn't hurt bushes. Well, you could treat white top with 2,4-D, and if you're staying under the bushes and it's like volatility is an issue, I think it would be all right. But it, there isn't a herbicide that you could use on white top if it came in contact with a bush that it wouldn't hurt the bush. So is that where you want I mean, to wick it on or use like cardboard to block the bush? Yeah, I don't. Not do it on a hot day. <laughs> not do it on a hot day. Um, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure if the question there is like if you get the herbicide on the bush or you're spraying under the bush, but I you wouldn't it. want to get it on the bush. right under the bush. Right, Yeah. right. I would mow, you know. Mow it? Mow it yeah, under the work. bushes and then treat it once you're away from the bushes. Okay, um, Erica, it's an interesting question from Tostin. This person wants to know how you select various fields to survey for the resistance to the pyrethroids. And this person would volunteer to have his field. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> so can you, do you have a marker or do you have to grow them out and spray them? Um, so it depends on which, there are two facets of what we do in the water lab. First is I go out and I collect the weevils and bring them back and determine the lev level of resistance um, so I do about six to eight bioassays with those individuals. So I need about 10,000 weevils, um, which is a lot. And that helps me determine how extensive the degree of resistance is for that population. And then if we have the time for it, because it's all condensed to about a two week period for us, it really, it really is a, a bit of a stressful situation. But my counterpart, he's the research associate in the lab, he does an insecticide spray trial. And essentially what we try to do is corroborate our findings. So I go out first and then he follows. And if we are lucky, we're able to corroborate our findings and also get yield data. So we can see how the alfalfa stand is impacted by this defoliating insect species and how the quality of the forage is impacted as well. So that's one aspect. As for figuring out where we go and what we do, I usually rely on extension agents. At least that's how I've identified the populations in Montana that I've been to. I also go, I work closely with chemical applicators across the West, USDA personnel, uh, uh, entomology professors at UC Davis, Oregon State University, and Arizona State. And essentially, we go where they tell us to go. And sometimes if we go to an area and I see a really 
decimated alfalfa stand, I'll beg to jump out of the car and take my sweet net <laughs> and collect that population. And uh, so we have some unknown populations as well um, through those efforts. Uh, there's a lot of those. But in general, so uh, Kevin and I are submitting a paper soon uh, detailing the extent of pyrethroid resistance in the West. And we have run bioassays with at least 70 populations. So we've been all over the place. Okay, interesting. Um, that sounds like a fun project to me. Um, from Billings, um, this person has a cabin in southwest Montana. They would like some advice for getting rid of spotted knapweed around the cabin. Jane? Yeah, so spotted knapweed is actually a species that we have a lot of options for. Um, it's kind of Montana's poster child, uh, <laughs> noxious weed. We've done a lot of work on it over the years at MSU and U of M, and you know, uh, we're kind of leading. We're the experts on that. So uh, lots of options, you know, hand pulling. If it's just isolated plants, getting out there this time of year and, and pulling. Uh, you can also mow spotted knapweed. So let it grow up and get to the point where you have flower buds just starting to open. That's when you want to come along and mow it and take it off. You don't want to mow it repeatedly, uh, you know, every couple weeks because it'll just grow three, four inches tall and still flower and produce seeds. There's also uh, different biocontrol agents, so different insects. There's uh, three or four of them that are very effective on spotted knapweed. Uh, they won't completely get rid of the knapweed, but they will stress it and, you know, reduce its size, reduce its seed production, reduce its root mass. And then there's a variety of herbicides that are all very effective on knapweed. The trick with knapweed is it does accumulate a lot of seeds in the seed bank. So if you kill some adults once, whether you're hand pulling, you know, insects, mowing, uh, herbicides, you're still going to have plants coming back from that seed bank. So it is a fairly long-term commitment because those seeds can live 12 years or so in the soil. Okay. So if people were interested in these biocontrol options, where could they go to get them? Yeah, so the biocontrols, there's uh, a couple species that are well established across uh, Montana. I would, I'm guessing if this person's in southwest Montana, they already have some of the Lorinus and Europhora insects. Um, if they were interested, you, you can purchase. There are commercial providers of these biocontrol insects. There's also collection days where you can go out to a place uh, as a group. There's, they're organized. Uh, some of our extension agents and our weed district coordinators hold these days. Um, you can go out and collect your own insects and take them home with you. So the, the kind of the go-to source for, that I would suggest the, the viewer reaches out to is Melissa Maggio with the Montana Biological Control Coordinating Program. And the website is mtbiocontrol.org. So. Okay, thank you. Um, from Shelby, uh, this person is interested and resistance, but they would like to know, are there resistance to fungicides in the state of Montana, as well as resistance to insecticides? Mary, that's yours. Well, I'll start with fungicides and I'll pass it to Erica. Um, we do know that Ascochyta blight on chickpea is resistant to the strobilurin or QOI fungicides. Um, we're concerned a little bit about malaxyl and pythium, uh, which is a soil-borne disease of many crops. Uh, it has been reported in Washington and we've kind of been keeping a lookout and we do know that there's another species of pythium that just isn't sensitive to it at all. Um, so just keeping an eye on that and, and nothing else, but I suspect there's quite a bit um, in tan spot and subtorian wheat. We just haven't looked. Yeah. And it's probably the same thing with a lot of the insecticides, a lot of it hasn't been looked at. Yeah. And same with wheat. Yeah, there's uh, quite a few species that have resistance to different modes of action. It's a, an issue in crop production more than it is in range and pasture weed management. Okay. We had a question last week, and we don't, really don't have anybody on the panel. I don't know, maybe Mary can answer this. This person wants to know, is avian or bird flu 
still present in the state, and yes. I think it is. Absolutely. Um, our 4-H fair, we can't bring the chickens. We're going to be showing pictures of chickens. Interesting. Yeah. How widespread is it? I'm just hearing them small pockets. I, I have not attended any of the webinars, but I know the veterinary diagnostic lab is very busy with carcass samples, um, and I would assume it's widely prevalent. Okay. Uh, a Facebook question for Abby, and this came in last week. I wrote it down here. I like this question. What size container should you use for potted tomatoes, and can you use indeterminate varieties? in those pots? It's a good question. That is a good question. So for me, I like to have either anywhere between a five to 10 gallon container for tomato plants that gives them enough room to grow. You can grow indeterminate tomatoes in containers, but you're gonna need to stake them up so that as they continue to vine, you can, they, they can grow that way. But aim for about a five gallon container for one tomato plant, that's a good size. And then put a little basil around it so you can just have there some cook crazy on the go. <laughs> Absolutely, that's a great idea. <laughs> Abby, what do you think about the containers that are wheeled so you can move them around? Yeah, I mean, sure, why not? As long as they have a, a good you know, spot where they still drain from, um, mm -hmm. drain that moisture, why not? Um, tomatoes need a lot of that sunlight, and sometimes right. if we have those shady areas, you might be chasing that sunlight <laughs> a little bit with your tomato plant, so yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, this is a question for Jane, and it's uh, kind of interesting. Uh, it's from Victor. The caller is curious on any information or resource about how people can use weeds like mullein, plantain, catnip, and dandelions to be productive instead of just spraying and getting rid of them. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of the species that are here that are problematic were, some of them were intentionally introduced for medicinal or culinary purposes. Um, so, um, I don't know a lot about that, but there certainly are books and other resources about how to use different plant, I mean, not just weeds, but you know, plants in general. The one thing I would say is if you are going to do any collecting and you know, some of your own um, work with plants, make sure you know for sure what you're collecting so you're not getting something toxic. And then also make sure you would be collecting from an area where no herbicides have been used so you're or insecticides, so you're not ingesting any of those pesticides. Good point. You know, on that note, I have dogs that love to eat grass, and I think most people that have dogs, um, they're gonna eat some grass. And I spray with 2,4-D, is that gonna be an issue? Uh, I think, well, always read the label. I know The that. label says, you know, most labels will say how long you should keep pets or humans out of an area after you use it, whether it's a herbicide or insecticide or fungicide, whatever it might be. Um, a lot of times it's until the, for plants, a lot of times that re-entry interval is like once it's dried yeah. on the plant. But kind of, I think a safe rule of thumb would be 24 hours. I agree, and I kind of watch that. Yeah. Yes. The dogs are kind of okay. So <laughs> anyway, uh, Erica, this is a good question. It comes from Bozeman. Uh, once you finish your PhD, what do you want to do in the arena of agriculture? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, well, I'll just answer it broadly. I am fascinated by taking a problem in the field and bringing it into a lab figuring out what's going on and help identify a solution to the problem and testing it in the field. Because one, a problem in the field may not be easily defined in the lab and a solution developed in the lab cannot be easily applied to a field setting. And so figuring out what's going on and how to fix it is definitely one aspect of a career that I would absolutely love to have. That's fun, there's no doubt fun. about that. Uh, Mary from Three Forks, this color spruce tree has about 20% of the tree with brown needles. Any idea why and what can they do? And that's a tough question. Th that's a tough question to answer. You need to know the pattern. Um, if it's, yeah. So I would give the diagnostic lab a call at 406-994-5150 and ask for Eva. Uh, <laughs> Eva will She knows ask all for about sample. spruces and, <laughs> okay. and we'll want some photos. That's true. Uh, Jane, last week from Butte, Black Medic, this person says, help. Uh, 
they <laughs> spray with 2,4-D and they pull a lot, but none of it seems to work real well. Yeah, I have black medic, you know, around my garden beds and in my yard. It's really difficult to get rid of. You, you kind of got to do it all. Herbic I would say herbicides, pulling maybe some black tarping or like trying to um, cover it so it's not getting any sun for a season. Mm -hmm. Abby, do you have any thoughts yeah. on it? I, I think, yeah, mulching would be a good mulching. in your garden beds. Just You can use the, the black um, mulch or you can use wood chips about three inches deep or so, but mm -hmm. I would say that. Yeah, try everything. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, Abby's up, a Facebook question. This has come in two or three times and we kind of glossed over it a couple weeks ago. Uh, this person would like to know, is it okay to transplant sagebrush? I mean, you can transplant sagebrush. Um, I don't know what they mean for if it's okay to do that. Well, I don't I like see any problem with digging somebody's sagebrush if you have permission. Yeah, it depends on yeah where you're getting it from. But if, if you're relocating it from you know a place where you have permission to get it from, you can. I, one mm -hmm. comment on that is make sure you're, you're trying to transplant small plants because yeah. those sagebrush roots develop, the root is probably developing way faster than what you see above the ground. And it has a fairly, uh, almost like a tap root, a very central uh, root. And if you damage that or don't get enough of it, it's very difficult to transplant it and keep it alive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, follow up on that last question for Erica. How long does it take to finish a PhD program? That's another good question. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on your committee and how much they like you. Um, <laughs> oh, but um, and it depends as well as to like whether or not you have a master's degree beforehand. I've found I've benefited a lot from having a master's degree before coming on as a PhD student. Um, this is my third year. I have about a year left. Um, at this point, I've done all my qualifying exams as of last winter. So it basically comes down to the research that I do, the quality of the data that we have, and how, how confident my committee members are in my ability to be an entomologist. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, again, more questions on gophers. Stay tuned or get a hold of Stephen Van Tassel. Um, Mary, from Park City, spruce has spots on needles and they're dropping. Any suggestion there? Call Eva. <laughs> yeah, you're passing Eva. Well, I I'll don't be. know if they're brown spots, if they're white spots. You know, I need a little more detail on that one. I don't know, Abby, you know of any epidemics in Park City? Uh, not off the top of my head, but yeah, I would say get it, get it diagnosed with Eva. Okay, mm -hmm. we're about running out of time here. Time to spray apples for worms. You got 10 seconds. Yeah, so <laughs> contact your local extension office and ask them about codling moth if you have worms in your apples and they'll be able to tell you what you need to do. Okay, folks, we're about out, again out of time. Erica, thank you for joining us this evening. The rest of the panel as always. And Jane, uh, you're on two weeks, so let us know what you're bringing right. to eat then. Let's start thinking about it. All right, next week, Diane Charlton, Labor Issues in Agriculture. Thanks for watching. See you next week. For more information and resources, visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club.
Programming on Montana PBS is made possible in part by viewers like you, the friends of Montana PBS. Thank you. And by the Montana Nursery and Landscape Association, a trade association of horticulture professionals who can assist with yard, gardening, and outdoor space questions. Members in your area can be found at plantingmontana.com. And by the Montana Farmers Union, a grassroots organization working for family farmers, ranchers, and rural communities. Online at montanafarmersunion.com. And by the Nature Conservancy, protecting the beautiful lands and waters you love. From your cold, clear rivers to your favorite outdoor getaways, the Nature Conservancy works to keep Montana a place where both nature